Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Antoine, the museum educator at the Button Woods Museum, uh, and I'm here to welcome you all to tonight's program, uh, sponsored by a grant from the Cummings Foundation. So we're in our third year of our Revitalized Button Woods project, uh, which is a diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative funded by the Cummings Foundation. Uh, and part of that initiative is bringing you stories that reflect our community. So, in celebration of Native American Heritage Month, I'm so pleased to introduce our speaker, Charlie Nauru, uh, here from Newton, Mass. Uh, Charlie Nauru is Puerto Rican Taino, a member of Ayud Kayake Guaido, if I said that correctly, it's the best I can do. Uh, she is also the liaison of the United Confederation of Taino People. Uh, she and her son, Vinny, do many exhibitions to honor Taino lifestyles and traditions, the indigenous culture of the Caribbean islands. And I'm so thrilled to turn over the stage to her. Please give her a warm welcome. We acknowledge and honor the Abenaki people and welcome our people's past and present on whose traditional lands and waterways the Blood Woods Museum is located. Massachusetts, the name, comes from the Massachusetts language term for at the Great Hill, referring to the Blue Hills overlooking Boston Harbor from the south. The indigenous nations that belong to this land are known as the Akuna Wampanoag, Mashpee Wampanoag, Stockbridge, Munsee, Mohegan Nation, Nipmuc, and other Massachusetts tribes. We respect and recognize it is a privilege to be living on these lands as guests. We acknowledge the trauma experienced over centuries to the indigenous peoples who live on these lands and continue to face injustice. We honor with gratitude those peoples who have stewarded this land. We also acknowledge that these lands are sacred to generations yet to be born. I wanted to start that with this land acknowledgement as I also am a guest on these lands. Charlie Mallory, could you please turn on your microphone? <laughs> Hello. Okay. the United Confederation of Taino people, I've always been taught that in order to begin, we always want to address everyone in our tribal language. And if you notice, my tribal language is not English or Spanish or any other colonized language. So to translate what I said is, good evening, my brothers and sisters. My name is Chavi and I represent the United Confederation of Taiwan People. I'm a liaison. I'm also a citizen of the Guainia Taino tribe. And I'm so honored and happy to be here. So thank you, Hapon, thank you. I also want to thank Antoine from Hino Aponte and the Woods Museum and this beautiful library for having me here today. It's so amazing to be here. I did get lost though. <laughs> so with that being said, um, let's talk Caribbean, Caribbean indigenous peoples and the introduction to the Taino culture. All right, I'm going to be going slide by slide and um, speaking a little bit of it. So if you get confused or anything, just please let me know and I'll, I'll stop for a second. So. <laughs> this is the region that we're going to focus on, the Greater Antilles area, which has islands like Cuba, Jamaica, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and Haiti and all these lesser Antillean islands. We'll be touching a bit more on the region as a whole. Oftentimes, when we talk about culture, what I've seen over the years, there's a tendency to kind of isolate things and put things in a box and not see that it's really connected to everything around you. So if you really look at this map, you're gonna see the islands were not in isolation at all. There are no walls. This allowed for interchange, like trade. All this was happening thousands of years before it was written or spoken about like it is today. People were recording history, of course, all throughout time, just in different ways. It's the way it's been told and still told today. 
that the misunderstandings or misinterpretations occur. Now, when we talk about Caribbean, usually what comes to mind, as you see here? You got the beaches, there's Carnaval, the Pirates of the Caribbean, the movies. It's so fun, all the outfits that are worn are absolutely gorgeous. But there's much more to this story. It's way deeper than that. It really starts with this guy right here. I don't really know which one of these guys is the real guy, since there's so many images of this particular person. Do any of you? Do you know who this guy is? Yeah, Christopher Columbus. This is the reality. We really don't know who people are at some times. It just goes to show how things are shown, portrayed, and how we absorb the information fed to us. Imagery, imagery speaks volumes, but for us, the way I like to think about it in this history, in this historical context, I say, BC, before Columbus. I want to focus on this image here because this is where it all started, the 500-year-old cycle. We all have heard that tune, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. You don't even hear about what else happened there. The minute you hear the name Columbus, the first thing that comes to mind is that jingle, how he discovered America, the greatest navigator. Remembering the prior, the prior slide to which my ancestors were already navigating those waters thousands of years before he even. In this image, can someone tell me what you see? Anybody? Can you tell me what you see in that image? Okay, anything else? Well, this, this indigenous people there. Hey! Yes. Right, my ancestors, the Taino people. You hear Columbus' story, but you rarely hear about who he met when he was, when he was discovered, lost at sea. Here you see the big wigs claiming the land as their own. If natives aren't seen, how about these people over here in the right corner? They're hard to see, and it was intended to be that way. Our people, to them, were savages. We meant nothing. We were invisible. This painting has been redone many times throughout the years. As you can see here, it's modified slightly in the stamp. Where the indigenous people are so small, almost seem like children, not important. You see how they're all towering over them? Our people down here. That's what they want you to see. Indigenous peoples, who are indigenous peoples? This isn't per se a legal binding definition, but more of a working definition at the United Nations, at the UN level. This links indigenous peoples to colonization, and what that means is peoples that were there pre-invasion. The indigenous communities, peoples, and nations are those that, having a historical conti con continuity with pre-invasion and pre-colonized co colonial societies that developed on their territories, consider themselves distinct from other sectors of the societies now prevailing in those territories or parts of them. Here are a few examples of words used to describe indigenous peoples. Ameri Indian, American Indian, Native American, Native peoples, Aboriginal people, and First Nations. So all this links to the concept of indigenous peoples. So when you hear me say that, you keep that in mind that this is what we're talking about in the Caribbean content. <clears throat> so what happens? There's a new world encounter. With indigenous peoples, oftentimes, you get this image. The indigenous giving something, or vice versa. You'll see some sort of trinkets, beads, or pieces of glass, etc. This is one of the ways 
They, the colonizers, are presented even at the early stages of education. Basically, here's the story. <laughs> Columbus came, landed, discovered the land, they were Indians, there you go, the end. <laughs> On the next subject, that's because all, that's what they, the kids can handle these days. There's a whole lot of other things that happen here, but usually, in this context, they connect it to the Colombian exchange. Again, look what it says. It keeps it mellow, doesn't really get into the subject subtleties of the movement. Colombian exchange is the widespread transfer of plants, animals, culture, human populations, technology, and ideas between the Americans and the old world in the 15th and 16th century. Related to European colonization and trade after Christopher Columbus's 1492 voyage. Columbus got here, so European colonization is mentioned. But there was a lot of trade. It opened up all these new things from this side of the world, which they call the new world. The other side of the world, they call the old world. So you have this kind of exchange going. Corn is the biggest export of this side of the world, and it's been situated all over the world. If you travel to the Himalayas up into Nepal, there you'll find different varieties of corn, which they've never had before. Why is this important? In this image, you see corn, maize. It was the indigenous peoples that developed the corn and with that transported all over the world. This impacts the world in a huge way. What happened in the Caribbean exchange, what happened in the Caribbean changed the face of the planet. Now, here are some quotes from Columbus when he came. Right in the beginning, he describes Caribbean as a paradise on earth. Trees all along the river, beautiful and green and different from ours, with flowers and fruits, each according to their kind, many birds and little birds which sing very sweetly. Now I'm talking about our people. So free with all they possess that no one would believe it without having seen it or anything they have. If you ask them for it, they never say no. Rather, they invite the person to share it and show as much love as if they were giving their hearts. And he goes on, talking to the queen, I certify to your highness that in the world I believe that there are no better people nor better land. They love their neighbors as themselves and have a speech that is sweetest in the world and mild and always laughing. Why did he say all that? Well, look at it, it's obvious. Our lands are beautiful, harmonious, rich in agriculture. Remember why many people want to visit the Caribbean in the first place. Look at this image. We're talking about a lush, lush green environment that has a year-round growing system with average temperatures in the 80s and that includes the water temperatures. You can see the mountain range, and where there are mountains, there's lots of rain. What do we get from that? Fresh water. So you see, that's why Columbus spoke the way he did about what his encounter was like. The environment was a reflection of the people. The people were so giving because Mother Earth was so giving. There was plenty for everyone. Again, back to BC, before Columbus, I just want to remind you that the Caribbean was already a hub before the arrival of Columbus and his new crew, with many different cultures exchanging and interacting over thousands of years. Remember the walls? So people were coming up from the South America, you have our Arawak and Carib relatives, as well as the Mesoamerican folks, the Mayas, the Mexicas from Central America. There was even travel and exchange to the southern tip of Florida, which we call Benin, its original name. You can all see the areas where this stuff was happening in the Calinago, Carib, etc. That's where we get the name Caribbean from, from Carib. Many ask, how were they able to do this? Get around? Well, by this. Our people are the ones that created the canoa, the canoes. This ingenuity, like my wordplay, yeah. To create a watercraft called canoa, the canoe. 
canoa is actually another Taino word that has been adopted by the Spanish and still used today. So a lot of people speak Taino and don't even realize it. <clears throat> That's where the word canoe came from. These canoas, canoes, were built in ways that one alone can hold up to 150 people. Back then, our people were eating off the land. Everything came from the earth. No such thing as preservatives and, substitute, and substitutes. Definitely no Mickey D's. Our people were healthy and fit, always farming, fishing, hunting, working hard, building these canoes and bohios, which were our homes that we lived in, and trading throughout the region. Along with fishing, one other major food source was turtles. No person is perfect, but through the years, knowledge grew with that, and so did the villages. Back then, sea, tur sea turtles were everywhere, so large that four men could fit inside one shell. Nowadays, you're lucky if you see one due to climate change, pollution, etc. If a turtle came up and laid eggs, the indigenous would take a few, but leave some behind so that the turtle would come back again and lay more. That was their way of thinking. They only took what they needed to feed their people, and that was it. They left the rest, turtles would come back, they always had food. Here, you can see the ways of interaction amongst the families. Cooking, arts, culture, ceremonies, dances. You can see the bohios, the, the homes that you see there which were constructed in ways that can withhold hurricanes. Huracan, another time in the world. The bateng is where these activities often happen. It was a circular space usually surrounded by stone wall. A cane, the longhouse, is where the chief cacique would be. Another thing I want to share is the fact that the people also intermarry with other chiefdoms. During the travels and trade, our people learn to speak different dialects to communicate. The word relative is dear to us and it expresses how we're all interconnected. Everyone learned from one another in order to set the tone for the future generations. Now, communities are building up and continuously growing. Territories start to form and that's what happened here. Over here in the island of Hispaniola, Hiskeya, five Taino territories, and within them, you may have many villages, each with its own chief or chieftain. They have hierarchy, administration for their functions, but under that, they keep going almost to what people have here, a democracy. Then they have another chief, a council meeting, a chief who oversees the admin of those whole territories. Over here is Boriquín. You know what it is, Puerto Rico. Over 20 at the time that Columbus came. Columbus kind of passed the island around 1493, but he didn't go over there to settle. Puerto Rico doesn't get settled till 1508. This here is to show you that there definitely was form of governance, where you have many unified territories. Chiefs, their strategies that made for coexisting. There may have been some unpleasantries, but not an all-out war. Hence why Columbus didn't record them being actively at war or hating one another. Since we're talking about chiefs here, I also want to point out that in our Taino communities, chiefs are male and female. We call them cacique, which means covered by the sun. Spaniards were not used to seeing women in leadership. So that threw them for a loop. I mean, coming from a lifestyle and philosophy where everything is focused on the male. God is the father. The God transferred power to the king, who is male. Then the men lead the household and so on. Now in Taino philosophy, the creation and the beginning of the movement starts with female energy. <laughs> Atabe is who gives birth to the sun. It starts with the female, it's only logical. I mean, don't we all come from a woman? Okay. 
Here you can see a gathering called an areto. It's like what you would recognize a powwow to be. The singing, the dancing, the feasting, the fun times. We, in our community, we have aretos like four times a year because we have the seasons change. So we have summer solstice, um, fall equinox, winter solstice, and spring equinox. And our aretos are amazing. And we also have one in the summertime Right before summer solstice is called the children's areto, and it's dedicated only to our wai, our children. So when they um, they grow and they learn all about our people from childhood. <clears throat> Here's some more of the bade, the circle where the activities occur. This is this is actually in Puerto Rico. This site is called Caguana. You can go there, physically see this bate. Here also is where the games called batu are held. This is a sport, kind of like a fusion of soccer and basketball. One must use their body to get the ball to a hole. So feet, legs, hips. So it's like this. And you hit the ball like this to get the ball over into a hoop that's coming out of a stone wall so high. Yeah, look, mom, no hands up. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of friends that play that. And when she's done, she has like a million bruises. <laughs> so what is interesting about this was when they played. This game was used as a form of a court. So you think of here, we stand in front of a judge, and you know there's the plaintiff and, and the defendant. So when our people, what they did was we used the bate and the sport batu as our court proceedings. There was no war. We just took it out, all, out in the arena. Whoever won the game won the battle. Now we're looking at actual artifacts constructed by Taino people. Along with singing and dancing, there's also artists. Look at these stone sculptures. Each of these represents certain things, but that's a whole other story. The intricacies, the use of ivory inlay. Wood sculptures are scarce, but that's because wood breaks down faster and harder to preserve. Here's what is called a dugo. This is a dugo. The dugo is our cacique's seat. It's pretty tall, so he sits above everyone else. The other image, this here, and please don't get freaked out, but this is this image right here. The ivory inlay, they're actually real teeth. There's actually a real skull inside that wrap. It's preserved something incredible. Here are some more examples of Taino artwork, the pottery. Again, it talks about their philosophy in life. You have the female and male duality. The connection you see, those two faces looking again, it's talking about the way they saw the world. In other words, there was less separation in the mind of the Taino and more connections. These necklaces are actually made out of bone. Okay, so now moving on. So what happened to all that beautiful culture? Well, here, we come back to this guy. Remember, he said how beautiful it was and these people are so sweet. Well, that's when this happened. It appears to me that the people are ingenious and would be good servants. And I am of opinion that they would very readily become Christians as they appear to have no religion. Okay. <laughs> Every time I get to this part. <laughs> it's so upsetting because 
You just stopped all our rich history, all our rich culture that we've been practicing for thousands of years. But because this white man comes to our lands and territory and says, we don't worship the Bible, we don't worship Jesus Christ, we don't worship, we don't, we're, we're savages, we don't have a religion, we don't. So who was he to determine what we were supposed to believe in and what we were not? And it's upsetting because you still have that to this day, present time. And it's unfair because Creator made us all individual and we are who we are as a person and we have the choice to believe in whatever we want to believe. <clears throat> That changed quickly now, didn't it? And unfortunately, this is the part that is omitted from the history books. What he actually did to my ancestors once he realized that he could, in their eyes, they only saw savages, a people ready to be servants with no religion, no connection. Look at this image. Just take a good 30 seconds to study it. He goes on and says, with 50 men, I could subjugate them all and make them do everything that is required of them. What does that mean? Required. Required of our people. What was required of our people? Sure enough, that's what transpired. And for those little ones here, oh, wait, there's no little ones here. <laughs> this was just when they were children. Sometimes I do this presentation in front of children. This actually happened. This isn't the walking dead. My ancestors' hands were cut off. Enough gold wasn't found. So if they, if they didn't find their gold that they wanted, they would literally chop off my ancestors' hands. They, you, they would rip infants away from their mother's bosom and feed them to their dogs. Another thing that they would do is use lady parts and their skin to make purses, handbags. This is all the atrocities that these people did to my ancestors. Thirteen men were hung and tortured at the time because thirteen represented Jesus and the twelve apostles. Women were assaulted, beaten. Girls as young as nine were sold and passed around to do as they pleased. Remember, all this was done in the name of Jesus Christ. This is the truth that's been kept from all of us for generations. Here you have two images. The left is a depiction of the Spanish treachery against Cacique Anacaona, the cacique from Ayiti, from Quisqueya, Dominican Republic. It is recorded that the Spanish befriended the chief, but only to get close enough to commit heinous acts, as you see here, burning the villages, and at the end, hanging the chief. Remember, they were not used to women in leadership. So what they did was, Say, hey, let's have a meeting with all your chiefs and let's talk about a treaty. Eighty chiefs showed up, Tainos thinking this was their way, and being the diplomatic people, agreed to this meeting in the longhouse. And once they were all there, the image on the right is a depiction of, Casqui uh, of Cacique Hatuay from Cuba. This is one of those times that makes you think, wow, how can this have happened? But did it? You see Cacique tied to a stake? What you don't see is the entire village watching this happen. Cacique is told by the Spanish if he converts to Christianity, that when he dies, he will go to the kingdom of heaven. Cacique replies, where do all of your people go when they die? The Spanish replies, to heaven, of course. Cacique then says, well, let me burn. Cacique didn't want his soul to be anywhere near these people who committed all these violent acts. The entire village and all their power screamed out his name, Hatway, Hatway, 
letting him know that they were there with him till the end. So in, again, in this image, you can see that Cacique was being hung. After all the 80 chiefs were in the longhouse, that whole supposal tree that they pretended that they wanted to have, they just got all the caciques in there and burned them all alive. People have a misconception that the Taino people didn't stand up for themselves, though. And they just let this invasion happen. Well, that's farthest from the truth. Cacique Guarocacuya, also known as Enrico, Enriquillo was a Taino cacique who rebelled against the Spaniards from 1519 to 1533. He achieved the first treaty between indigenous peoples and Europeans in the Western Hemisphere. What I want to point out here is the dates. Cacique rebelled against the Spanish from 1519 to 1533. If you look at the history books, they mention that Taino were extinct by this time. Wah, wah, wah. No, we're not. Here's proof, again, which in the history books, when someone writes, oh, they're no longer here, people read it, then you're going to believe that. So that's, what is, what is that called? Paper genocide. Nine years later, the Queen of Spain made new laws called Laws of the Indies in 1542 after being petitioned, petitioned by the people. During this time, what saved the Taino people was the fact that most left the Caribbean to Peru for gold. That was where a lot of it was found. They didn't come to the Caribbean to plant beans. They came to find gold. This was also the times that the transatlantic slave trade was happening, bringing over the enslaved Africans. Why? Well, they had to make up for the loss of the Indian slavery. Design, this, these laws, the new laws of 1542, were designed to protect Indians and restrain encomiendo, prohibited Indian slavery, prohibited new encomiendo's inheritance of old ones, and provoked rebellion in Peru. <laughs> Within those new laws, the Spanish were slick. They were able to find a loophole. Now remember, they, that law was supposedly protecting the Indian. So, there's a loophole though. Any Indian found to be a cannibal could be enslaved. <laughs> so, were they really cannibals? Let's think about this. No, there isn't any archaeological evidence anywhere that proves this. What happened is they decided to make a good Indian and a bad Indian. The Taino, the good people, and the Caribs, the bad people. But remember early on, I showed you how all the Caribbean had been interchanging and trading thousands of years before colonization, and we spoke different dialects of the Arawakian language in order to communicate with our relatives. In the history books, you'll read how Caribs came in fighting the Spanish. It was our own people fighting against them. The Spanish turned them into Caribs so they could enslave the folks that they were rebelling. Bunch of BS, so many lies. In Puerto Rico, census made at the end of the 18th century in 1799 by order of Carlos III of Spain, there were 2,302 Taino Indians living in central Cordillera, Puerto Rico's central mountain range. These places today are known by our people as the Indieras, Indian lands. In the year 1800, the term Indio or Indian was officially removed as a racial category from all Puerto Rico census reports. The category Color Pardos Libres was added, free people of color. Over 20,000 people in Puerto Rico identified themselves as American Indian. In 2010 U.S. Census report, a 49% increase in the number of island Puerto Ricans to do so. 
In 2000, the number was 13,336. Look at my casique. That's my cheek, you guys. Casique Roberto Bucaro. The U.S. Census Bureau recently released the 2020 data sets on American racial and ethnic origins in the report entitled Detailed Demographic and Housing Characteristics, File A. The reporting is the culmination of an analysis of 350 million detailed responses to the race and ethnicity questions that were collected in a 2020 census. A significant population increase is noted 85% from 2010 among American Indians, including the indigenous Taino. The overall number of the Americans claiming indigenous heritage increased from 5.2 million in 2010 to 9.6 million in 2020. The increase is significant, especially for the Taino, whose total recorded population number in 2022 is 112,682. This means that according to the U.S. Census, the Taino are the 10th largest American Indian population of all the recorded American Indian groups in Borigain, Puerto Rico, 50,114 identified themselves in the census as Taino, while over 26,000 identified themselves as Taino in New York. Other large Taino population areas on the U.S. mainland include Florida and Connecticut. That's amazing. We're still here. We're still here. The new report from the U.S. Census Bureau indicates that they have finally taken our continuous requests seriously, stated Roberto Mucaro Agueva Nabore, the current president of the United Confederation of Taino People and Cacique, chief of Guainia Taino Tribe. Borrero continued stating, we presented what we view as the past discriminatory interpretations of the census data to the highest level of the Bureau. We also indicated our, series, our serious concerns with continued reports of field officers. Census data collectors in Borique, Puerto Rico, who allegedly urged community members to identify themselves as white or told individuals that they could not identify as American Indians on the census. Now, just a few images before I end the talk, a few images of some of the things that is Taino, like on cassava. Hamaca, hamaca is a Taino word, a word, ha hammock, and uh, they use our indigeneity also in NASA. That's how it all starts. There's the, the wheel, baskets. This is Bibi Raniki. This is one of her quotes that is very well respected. The same way that they wrote us out of history, we will write ourselves back in. That just goes to that paper genocide. Here are images of, of some of my relatives. Uh, there's that's Nova over there standing with our relatives at Standing Rock. There's some of us there. You got Cacique, Taipelli, Taino, Lionheart, who has our UCTP, military, images of me. This was at a Springfield Puerto Rican festival. It was dedicated to the original roots, and uh, that is why it's Calugo. She was the Grand Marshal of the event, and I was invited to be part of that event. This is in ceremony. <coughs> Some more images. There's my son, and like I said, we're still here. Taino si existe. There's my grandson, who's three years old. and more images during a powwow, and my son states, I'm a person just like you. So even if you don't see us in regalia, we're still Taino. So with that, I'm gonna end my portion.
I say ha ho, thank you, gracias. I am going to give you a little surprise before we end this whole. You ready? Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. There's a little animal called the conch, and our people were fishermen. So, out to sea, we would fish the conch shell, grab them, gun them out, feed the families, feed the villages, use stones, cut out the holes. And then we have a card. This is our back in the day cell phone. <laughs> okay? This is what our people would use to communicate through village, village chiefdoms, if our people were out in the sea fishing and the people that were up in the mountains can see if there was a storm coming and they could blow their horn a specific kind of way, it would alert the fishermen to come back in. And if the wives needed the husband to babysit it, they would be like, mira, este, if I can hear. 
Maraca, so guano. Maraca, maraca is a Taino word. We say maraca all the time. You know, this is Taino. A lot of the Spanish adopted a lot of our words. Barbacoa, that's Taino. That's not Spanish. So when people are speaking these words, they're not realizing that they're speaking in Taino or Arawak language. And um, right now, just a few weeks ago, my tribal chief, Cacique Mucaro, just published a book called Guajia Taino, which says, which is called We Speak Taino. You can find that book on Amazon, Walmart.com, or BarnesandNoble.com. Um, it's, it's a public book. You can learn the Taino language and help us revitalize it. And to end this, I'm going to sing a song in two languages. I'm going to sing it in Taino and I'm going to sing it in, in Spanish. Um, and for those of you that don't even know either language, it basically is uh, a prayer to our son, to our Aracoy Way, giving us thanks. I'm giving him thanks for the light and the blessings and the, and, uh, the medicine that he provides on a daily. <clears throat> So, uh, so for our people, our indigenous peoples, Mother Earth, it's all about our surrounding. Everything is alive. And without the sun, there would be no daylight. Without the moon, there's, there's no light. So everything is very important. All our elements is, makes us who we are. So you have to look at us, or you, we look at us as vessels. Our bodies are vessels, but we're only energy. 
So when we pass on, we're not passing our body, we're passing our energy. So everything on water, uh, water is life. So in Taino, it's nito kaku, water is life. We are air that we breathe. So our sun is our heat. Um, and then coming from the Caribbean, how can you not love the sun? <laughs> and I'm a, I'm a fire sign, so like the sun is everything to me. Um, during these times, the, you know, when it starts to get winter, you know, everyone starts to be like, you know, I'm so cold, I don't want to leave the house, I don't want to do anything. But come the spring and the sun, and the sun comes out, and it looks like alive and reborn. So that also leads to our new year. We don't celebrate New Year with like the Gregorian New Year, you know, January 1st, that's not our New Year. Our New Year is the very first day of spring. Anybody else? So I'm back and forth, I'm back and forth from Borikain to here. So as an infant, I was born here in Boston, but as an infant, I was raised by my grandmother, by my baby, and I've always been back and forth from the Caribbean to here. So, but mainly the island of Puerto Rico. You know it as Puerto Rico. I don't identify it, I don't call it Puerto Rico. It's Boyke, since it's its original name. Um, a lot of people don't realize that Puerto Rico was not called Puerto Rico. It was called Boyke. What did you call Florida? Bimini. 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 Yeah, our people also, so believe it or not, before Columbus was navigating the waters, our people were already doing trade from the Caribbean all the way to the southern tip of Florida in those canoas that held 150 people. People don't believe that, but yeah, it's true. I just read something interesting about, um, you know, they're doing DNA studies, and um, they're finding out how far back in time your people go, oh. basically, and learning about the trade from back then, all through Mm -hmm. If you look up a, um, my jacket and my coat, um, there was a, a tooth that was found in the, in the Bahamas, I think it was the Bahamas, it was a female tooth, thousand years old, and it had Taino in And uh, a lot of people also don't know this, that 65% of Puerto Ricans have Taino DNA. So we're like, awesome. <laughs> 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 it sounds like you guys are trying to get related to Puerto Rico. But in terms of uh, East Asia, mm -hmm. is there also you know, a connection or a with the indigenous groups in the body that I've seen more related to Yes, okay. absolutely. That absolutely Kiskeya is Arawak. Kiskeya is Taino. So the the lesser Antilles in the Western Hemisphere, you have Puerto Rico, Cuba, Iskeya, you have the Virgin Islands, you have Trinidad and Tobago, you have all those Caribbean islands, they all make up Taino Arawak. They just may not. So one thing I want to also say is that Taino is not what they called our people. Taino basically means good people. So when Columbus came to the shores, and you know there's that language barrier, so when I guess he was introducing himself, our ancestors were like, Taino, Taino, so Ta meaning good, um, and good people. So he was trying, they were trying to let them know that we were good people. We were not there to harm them or anything like that. Um, and then I guess the word Taino just stuck. It's not bad. <laughs> I mean, like, the you have connections with the community I mean, in my tribe is more body game, but there is actual tribal chief that is from Kiskeya. He has his own Yukayeke, his own tribal nation. Um, he's out of Connecticut. Um, so, but my 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 tribe Guainia is not the only Taino tribe right now. There's so many with their own chiefs. Um, as a matter of fact, 
Um, we have Chief Cacique Phillips that's in the Virgin Islands. They're recognized, and they are our sister tribe, our sister white man tribe, and she's the chief over there in the Virgin Islands, and it's like officially recognized. Almost like saying federally recognized, like the uh, North American natives here, federal recognition, they also are recognized. We're working on that too. I actually have a question about uh, that. So, uh, uh, Puerto Rico or Puerto Rican is a, is a sovereignty of the United States. Does the recognition or reservation process, is it the same in Puerto Rico? As like a North American native situation? Yeah, yeah. No, it's not because. Um, we don't have reservations. That that didn't exist for our people. Um, and Puerto Rico's a commonwealth. And um, there's still a lot of stuff in the works that we're trying to get the government of Puerto Rico to, you know, officially recognize Taino people. And it, it's, it's a constant fight, but it's the same thing here with North American natives. You know, they want to pick and choose what tribes they want to federally recognize. Still, you got to go to the white man. And um, I find that to be disgusting. And that's my own personal opinion. <laughs> Anybody else? No? Uh, Yo, the wheels, I can see the wheels in your head turning. <laughs> is, uh, is the DNA testing helpful to build the connections? I mean, it, it, it is, but it's not necessary. I and mean, we don't do the whole blood quantum thing. And that's that. Back then, again, that did not exist. You were born there, and you were raised there, and you're tribal, and your indigeneity is there. That's all you need. But for me, I've always known I was indigenous. I mean, I would see my mom dress in, in indigenous wear. And asking my mother, what's going on? <laughs> I never got any answers. Like, it was one of those things where you grew up and you couldn't really speak about your indigeneity. And then my grandmother um, didn't really speak about it either. She would only say, we're Indian. We're Indian. That's it. Nothing more. And then it wasn't until adulthood that I was, I was like, listen, well, not adulthood. I was like probably like 13, 14 when I decided to like, you know what? I feel that I, I was looking for something and I couldn't find it. All these years I felt not complete. And then I started to just dive in and ask all these questions to my elders and I was getting more and more answers from distant relatives, not even like my immediate, like distant, like my, my great, great uncles I was getting these answers from, which was extremely helpful. And then finally, at, at adulthood, um, I always, I started wearing my headband. It became a thing, like I just felt more me when I would put my headbands on. And I was like 15. And then I think about 20 years ago, no, maybe about 15 years ago, I went to my first powwow. It was North American Native powwow. It was at the Mashpee powwow. And I was, I went to, to go to the beach at the Cape, and I saw the sign that said the powwow was, was it, it was active at that moment. And I just, I asked my friend to stop, and we went. And the minute I put my foot, I walked through that threshold, it was like, it was, some, it was something out of TV, like this unbelievable feeling, like it just went through my entire body. And it was like, almost like, ah, like something like, like I felt hope, like that was where I had to be. I, I, I found the connection that I needed. I, I dug my feet into the ground and I finally felt rooted. And from that moment on, till today, and I just kept with it and, and learning more and learning more. And, and I, then I had my son, and now my, that's all my son knows. This is my nephew. And I just keep doing the teachings and, and teaching and reteaching because of those narratives. Those, that's everything that everyone has grew up and learning. Even I, I, I grew up learning that you know, Columbus discovered America. No, he didn't. You know, and, and that's a sad thing, and that's why I'm here today doing what I do. 
and I love what I do, and I love seeing everyone's faces and the smiles, or the best one is, oh, really? I just had the other day, an elder lady didn't even know Columbus not a king yet, and she thought that Columbus was one of the pilgrims <laughs> that landed at Plymouth Rock, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is why I do what I do. You know, I was like, um, ma'am, that was 200 years apart, like 1492, and the Pilgrims was in the 1600s. Um, he was dead a million times over before. So like, they get those two mixed up all the time, Columbus and the Pilgrims. They put them into one whole basket, and that's not how things are. So, yes, um, everything I have, I make. Well, except for this, my sister made that. I'm not taking credit for Marisol Velasco's beating because she's amazing. The headdresses, um, we wear headdresses. It's our connection to our, our winged relatives. Our birds are very, very powerful. Um, for North American natives, the eagle is extremely important. Why? Because it's the bird that flies the highest. So the highest bird is the closest to the creator. Um, owl, this, these are owl, and there's red tail hawk. Red tail hawk is our bird from the south, uh, is also here. Uh, our bird, the condor, very powerful. That's why sometimes you read things about you know, the connection of the, the eagle and the condor. Um, the owl is very sacred for our people. It's our protector at night. It's not a, a nocturnal bird. It always would, you know, if there was any uh, predators or anything, you can hear them. They're always somewhere near the They don't like the owl. They find it as a death, you know, things like that. So there's so many different, you know, all nations are different, but, you know, we're, all, we're still all connected in, in, in some way. Um, Macaw. Yes, sir. Macaw, um, fertility. He's the last. But yes, if, if there's um, a woman that is wants to have a baby, we have the macaw, and we'll have like a smudge stick, and we'll smudge and. <laughs> but yeah, there's um, the caracoles, like uh, Guatuniki, he was wearing caracoles. Uh, our people are born there themselves with so many different things just from the land. Um, there was no gold. No gold. And if they had a piece of it, they had no idea what it was. It was something shiny and cute, you know? Um, what else? There was something else I wanted to say. Now I can't even remember it. Yes, yes. Tainos did trade with mines um, for with jade. That was a very that was like cash for them. Um, Guataniki and Tataniki they are Taino and mine. Um, Tataniki's. They're, both of their father's side are from El Salvador. So they are half Mayan. And they have rich history there too. And there's a lot, a lot of history. Our Taino people also come from that, that area. So, I mean, there's a creation story that, that you can look up, um, things like that. What about cuisine? Food. Well, like I kind of explained, Back then, you know, our staples was the juca. Is um, root. We made we listen. Just the other day, I had juca fries, and it was amazing. Me too. <laughs> I just had juca fries. Um, so that was our staple. That was our number one. Is the juca all our root turtle eggs? Huh? Can we get food later? I just bought you Burger King. Burger King is not part of the thing. <laughs> Just so you know, um, a lot of fish because our people were fishermen, so and for the Caribbean, so the sea was plentiful, so it was a lot of that. Uh, the conch, 
Um, right now, because you know, we had the the Spanish, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, my family, La Perla. My family, they were born and raised in from La Perla. And my father's side is from Seattle, Miami. Yeah. We're not getting food. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> He's always hungry. What is it with 13 year olds? Oh, yes. Yes. Oh, oh, yes. yes. So the simple that there's quite a number of prize numbers that's standing pretty much isolation for many years. And there's the back length of the fun, different groups. You know, is that helpful to be connected? I mean, the region of Central America has a lot of indigenous population. 100%. And I wish I could elaborate on that. I'm not too familiar with that. My tribal chief tours the world, um, visiting other tribes and meeting um, chiefs from other nations. And within the last 10 years, he did just that because in order to revitalize our Taino language, you know, we had to borrow some words from the Lacono people. Um, so like a lot of that comes from that, from those interactions, from those connections. And again, I'm sorry I can't elaborate more because I haven't been there. Um, if you have any more questions, that the email and on the pamphlet that was on the chair, our organization, the UCTP.org, if you email my any questions, they will be answered because my chief is the president of that organization. And um, yeah, if you really, really want some more info, he can elaborate on that. Yeah. So and then my email is also on there. So if you want to email me with other questions that I can research for you as well, so things that I don't know. I will do my best to get them answered as well. Yeah. So with that being said, I thank you. Thank you so much for having me here. And um, go with Creator. <coughs> thank you again. Thank you so much. So before we all head out, I would just like to encourage all of you to share what you've learned tonight. Uh, I think that's one of the most important lessons that we can take away is to start engaging with histories like this and, and share what you've learned. And of course, if uh, you follow us at the Buttonwood Museum, uh, you'll you know, be in the know of any more programs like this happening. And if you want to get involved, come by the museum. Uh, my name is Antoine. I'm the educator. And I'd be happy to talk to you. Thank you very much. And a big thanks to you. Thank you.